Welcome to the second module of this course. We are going to follow up on the previous module by continuing to work with electrophysiology data, but now at a larger spatial scale. In particular, we are going to look at human EEG data, and we'll be doing some spectral analyses or frequency analyses focusing on the SSVEP and on alpha oscillations. Uh, now, if you have no idea what any of these terms mean, then don't worry, you're going to learn all about them over the next several videos. The MATLAB work will continue focusing on functions using functions, and we'll also discuss sorting and indexing, data visualization, statistics, and other related topics. In the previous module, we were studying the action potentials of individual neurons, which reflect voltage fluctuations across the membrane of each neuron. Now, the voltage potential from a single neuron is too weak to be measured from far away from that neuron, let alone from outside the head. However, it turns out that when populations of neurons that are geometrically aligned become synchronously active, then the summed electrical fields generated by those populations is powerful enough to be measured from outside the brain through an electrode placed on the scalp. So this is the basic principle of EEG, which is short for electroencephalography. EEG is widely used in the clinic, and it's also widely used for fundamental research into cognition, perception, memory, language, and so on. Here you see an example of EEG data. So each row, each wiggly line in this image corresponds to the voltage fluctuations from one electrode, one data channel. So you can see that there were several dozen electrodes that were recorded simultaneously. Here you see the text labels corresponding to the location of the electrodes on the scalp. Now you can already see by looking at these data that there are rhythmic patterns of voltage fluctuations that are present across many different electrodes. These are called neural oscillations, and in this module we are going to quantify those oscillations. And so with that in mind, I'm now going to tell you about the SSVEP, which stands for the Steady State Visual Evoked Potential. It turns out that if you flicker a light at regular intervals, like a strobe light, then the visual system in your brain will respond at the same frequency, so at the frequency of the light stimulation. Now, that on its own isn't terribly surprising. However, it turns out that the amplitude of this rhythmic brain response to the flashing lights is modulated by cognitive factors, including attention. So if you pay more attention to the flickering light, then the amplitude of the brain response to that light is going to increase. And if you pay less attention to the flickering light, or if you're ignoring the flicker, then the amplitude of your brain response will decrease. This makes studying the SSVEP really useful for understanding attention, and also for clinical applications, for example, in brain-computer interfaces. So by having someone simply look at an array of letters where each letter is flickering at a different frequency, a machine learning algorithm can identify which letter the person is paying attention to, and this can be a way to type or use a cursor without actually having to use your hands. Now, you can see from this plot here that SSVEP and attention modulations are associated with several different kinds of dynamics in the EEG. Um, but here in this module, we are only going to be focusing on this rhythmic response of so the SSVEP itself. So, and how do we quantify a rhythmic or oscillatory response in the data? We're going to do that through the Fourier transform. The Fourier transform is one of the most important operations in signal processing and information communications. There's a lot of rich detail about the Fourier transform, but I'm just going to give you a bird's eye view so you get the conceptual idea of, of what we're doing to the data. Okay, so we start with our signal. Perhaps this is a bit of EEG data. And then we create a sine wave, which looks like this. We line up the sine wave with the data, and we test how similar the sine wave is to the empirical signal. 
Now that measure of similarity is something called the dot product. And the dot product is also the computational backbone of the correlation coefficient. So we're doing something that's a little bit similar to a correlation between a sine wave and a signal. And uh, in this particular example, obviously these two are strongly correlated. So when we plot the dot product on the y-axis at the x-axis location corresponding to the frequency of the sine wave, then we interpret this as the amount of energy or power in the signal at this frequency. Okay, so all of this is one step of the Fourier transform. The next step is to repeat this same process but using a sine wave with a different frequency. So this sine wave is a bit faster and you can see that it doesn't really look like the signal that much. So the dot product is much smaller. So then of course you repeat this for another sine wave frequency and so on and so on. And after repeating this procedure for many, many different sine waves for many, many different frequencies, we end up with a spectrum that looks something like this. So this is the signal in the time domain, and this is what its power spectrum looks like in the frequency domain. The interpretation of this spectrum is that there is decreasing power with increasing frequency, which is highly characteristic of complex systems. We sometimes refer to this as a one over F shape because it's, it roughly follows a distribution of one over F where F is the frequency. And we also see a peak here or a deviation from the spectrum. And this we interpret as an oscillation at you know whatever frequency this would be here. The procedure that I described in the previous slide is the conceptual idea. In practice, there are computational shortcuts for computing the Fourier transform. And that's done through an, a set of algorithms called the FFT, which stands for the FAST Fourier transform. Okay, so now you know a bit about EEG, about SSVEP, and about the Fourier transform. Now let me quickly tell you about the data set that we are going to be working with in this module. These are EEG data collected during an SSVEP experiment that was done by a PhD student in my lab. So in this experiment, the research participant was looking at a dot in the center of a computer screen, and there were four columns of smaller dots and each of these columns or each of these these dots were all flickering at different rates. So the flicker was uniform within each column uh, indicated by the number below. So all the dots in this column were flickering uniformly at 15 hertz. These dots were flickering at 20 hertz, 24 hertz, and 17.14 hertz. They look like a strange set of numbers here, but it was constrained by the monitor sampling rate. So there's more that's going on in this experiment. There were some attention modulations and some other cognitive factors. But for this module, we are only going to be focusing on a spectral analysis of the EEG data to see if we can find peaks in the power spectrum corresponding to some of these stimulus frequencies here. All right, so that is the end of video one. In the next video, we are going to do some visualizations of the EEG electrode positions then we'll move to spectral analysis of data from a single channel and from all of the channels. And from there, we will investigate topographical maps of the SSVEP power. And then in videos six and seven, we're gonna be looking at endogenous alpha and the relationship between alpha power and SSVEP power. Now, I haven't yet told you about endogenous alpha, alpha oscillations, but don't worry, I'll provide background in video six.